Um, so with that, we're going to proceed with the event. Um, so we would love to see all of your faces. I know ideally we would love to have an event like this in person, um, you know, but we're all online. So we'd love to see your faces to make this as personable as possible. The format of today's events um, is I'm going to start off with some questions for Suzanne. Um, after the interview, we're going to open it up to you as the audience. Uh, the way you can input a question is through the chat feature, and I will be asking the questions as they come in. So please make sure to mute your mics the entire time to avoid feedback or echoes. Um, and please, again, if you can, please turn your cameras on. So before we get started, I want to formally introduce Suzanne Abulhoa, who is a novelist, poet, essayist, scientist, mother, and activist. Her debut novel, Mornings in Janine, um, translated into 30 languages, is considered a classic and Anglophile Palestinian literature. I think I personally think that every person who is even slightly passionate about the Palestinian struggle has to read this book. Um, her second novel, The Blue Palestinian Sky and Water, was likewise an international bestseller. Abul Hawa is also the founder of Playgrounds for Palestine, a children's organization dedicated to uplifting Palestinian children, and she's a co-chair of Palestine, Palestine Rights, the first North American Palestinian literature festival. If you'd like to follow her on Twitter, her, um, her handle is at sjabulhawa, A-B-U-L-H-A-W-A, and her Instagram um, is at Suzanne, S-U-S-A-N, Abulhawa, A-B-U-L-H-A-W-A. I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, so, like I said earlier, we're very, very excited to have you with us today, Suzanne. Um, honestly, I've, I've, I love your book. Um, I look forward to t discussing your next book. Again, I haven't had a chance to read your second book, but it's definitely be on, been on my to-read list. Um, it's truly inspirational to see such a, you know, inspirational, exceptional woman making such leading efforts in, um, in the Palestinian struggle. Uh, so with that, let's start, let's start talking about your first book. So against, I mean, your third book, your next book that's coming out, um, Against the Loveless World. Uh, what can you tell us about it? Um, so first of all, thank you for um, your kind words. Um, the uh, um, against I have a copy here so you can see the cover um, the uh, against the loveless world is actually a quote from James Baldwin um, the the protagonist in the novel um, is a woman a Palestinian woman who uh, grows up with several different names um, one that her mother gave her one that her father put on her birth certificate um, naming her after his mistress um, she adopts a third name um, when she uh, becomes a sex worker in Kuwait. And, uh, and she, um, following the, uh, the Gulf War, um, in which, uh, or the, first of all, the Iraqi occupation of Kuwait, and then the first Gulf War, um, U.S. invasion that basically ended up making Palestinians in Kuwait refugees for second, third, or fourth time. Um, she ends up making her way back to Palestine where um, uh, fate just sweep, sweeps her up in a lot of ways. And um, it was there that she discovered literature, um, falls in love, and uh, um, with her, you know, soon to be husband, they read, um, she discovers Ghassan Kanafani, James Baldwin, um, and, and many others. So um, the whole story is narrated from an Israeli prison cell. So mm -hmm. does something yeah. <laughs> really, really important. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so what would you say is your inspiration behind writing this novel? Um, I, you know, all of my all of my novels come from uh, grains of experience here and there, and then you know, mixed with a lot of research, mixed with um, uh, a lot of imagination. My name? And I um, see my name. Sorry, I'm muting everybody. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, I was born in Kuwait. Uh, my family lived through the Gulf War. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm interested in characters who kind of live on the margins of society in one way or another, who don't really conform to this idea of, um, who we think the perfect Palestinian woman is. Um, and, and I'm interested in people who are, 
who are damaged in some ways. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so. So I, I, I love the twist of having it come out of an Israeli, um, you know, cell, prison cell. Where did that idea come from and how does it kind of play into the story? Yeah, um, that was entirely, I mean, it's a, it's a totally imagined kind of um, prison cell. It's actually, um, there's something really unique about it. It's a, it's a fully automated, um, highly technological, solitary isolation cell. Mm. And she's kind of a prison, she's kind of a special prisoner to them. Um, because, um, you know, she, she's kind of a, a bait for, for, for the man she loves, um, who is, uh, who is, who is a fighter that they've always wanted anyway. So I don't want to give the whole book away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So when, I know that it's coming out um, sometime later this year. Can you tell us a little bit about when exactly and how can someone, you know, maybe pre-order it or purchase it? So it, um, it comes out, it'll be released on August the 25th. Um, and I mean, it's available for pre-order everywhere. Um, I mean, you know, people who use Amazon, I mean, it's there, but um, we're encouraging people to try and use bookshop.org because um, bookshop actually benefits local um, independent bookstores. So if you become a customer at Bookshop, you just kind of list which bookstore you want the proceeds to go to and, um, and you'll benefit your local independent bookstore instead of, you know, um, mega corporation like Amazon. <laughs> um, yeah, I put the link in the chat. So for anybody that wants to go in, you can go specifically to bookshop.org. 100% agree with that approach. So I know that we spoke a little bit um, when we originally talked for the original call about cultural boycott. So cultural boycott is what calls for all artists, academics, philosophers, and cultural practitioners to refuse to participate in any activities, conferences, concerts, exhibitions, or any other related field in the country which is being boycotted. Um, I know that you refused, have refused, and continue to refuse just to sell your books in Israel. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and the impact that that's having and, and what was the motivation behind that? Um, so yeah, I am a signatory to the, um, the cultural boycott of Israel. I think it's important, um, what artists and, um, musicians and writers and, um, athletes and whomever, it's important what, uh, what we put our name to and carrying on business as usual with Israel and some is a tacit endorsement of what they're doing so um obviously as a palestinian that's not you know i'm not going to do business with a publishing house in my homeland that i can't even visit as a as a visitor and um you know one of the arguments that was posed to me was that you know well how else do you think how else do you expect israelis to learn um and this was a conversation that I had um, with the publisher there, who was, who was a really lovely woman, actually. Um, and my response to her was that it's not my job to, to teach them anything. You know, it's mm -hmm. not the job of, it's not the job of, of black and brown or indigenous or oppressed communities uh, to, to teach oppressors how to be decent human beings. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm that's their job, but also, you know, they live in such close proximity to, to Palestinians um, who are basically in, in two large open air prisons, both Gaza and the West Bank are both prisons. And, um, and they all serve in their uniforms. They all man the checkpoints. They, they go in, you know, in one way or another. So anyone who wants to learn really is, you know, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a far away place to, um, so yeah, but that said, I do consider, my objection is not that it would be translated into Hebrew because I, I consider Hebrew to be an indigenous language in Palestine. Hebrew has been spoken in that land, not, not necessarily the Hebrew that Israelis speak. Um, from what I understand, the actual original Hebrew is, is, uh, quite different and, and what the, mo you know, this modern sort of version is, um, uh, kind of a bastardization of, of the original Hebrew. Um, but so my objection is not 
um, is not that it be translated um, into Hebrew or even sold there, um, but not just not through any kind of Israeli business or institution. So if there's, you know, if there's a publishing house in Amman, for example, that translates into Hebrew and they want to sell it there, I mean, I would do that, um, but just not with Israel or any Israeli institution. Which makes sense. Um, so if you can talk a little bit more about the concept of cultural boycott and, and how would you, I guess, call other people, artists, authors to engage in that as well? So the culture, I mean, there, um, you, there are a lot of resources online. Um, uh, PACB, which is Palestine um, uh, Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. Um, but there's also U.S. ACBI, of which I'm a member, and that's the U.S. Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. Um, there are a lot of resources on there for people who, who wish to engage in the boycott, who wish to sign on to it, put their name to it officially. Um, and, uh, you know, in general, it's kind of like what I said earlier. You know, what you put your name to matters. And everybody has a responsibility. No one, you know, these things, um, you know, taking a moral stand should not be left up to to leaders i mean we we all have an opportunity to um to to conduct our lives in such a way that uplifts others as much as possible in in whatever capacity we can Simp you know refusing to engage israel um in business as, as business as usual is is really kind of a minimal offering of of um, solidarity that people can do for us mm -hmm. um, and do for our family in Palestine. So, of course, and I, and I think it's, you know, uh, that's for non-Palestinians, and I th but I think for, Palesti for Palestinians, especially Palestinians in the diaspora who do um, live with some amount of privilege, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a duty, <laughs> you know, not to not to sell Israeli goods if you have Absolutely. if you have a corner store somewhere, not to um, not to engage Israeli businesses, um, you know, because you want to make uh, a little extra money or, or more money or, or whatnot. I mean, I, it's it's possible to take moral stands, um, you know, without compromising um, without compromising anything else, and and. And even if it compromises finances, you know, I think um, these are these are things that that should be weighed by every individual um, in everything that we do. How much harm do we cause with the with the daily things we do, and what can we do differently, however small? Um, Absolutely, and I think that's a huge point that a lot of us have to question and see what is our part in this, and what can we do. And a huge one is just don't buy Israeli products, um, you know, so that's a very small, tangible thing that someone can engage in. Um, so talking about what you can do and given the current, um, you know, current events in the Black Lives Matter movement, um, what, what's your, what's going on with that? I know that you posted some things and you're getting a lot of, some pushback from Arabs, which of course is a huge issue that we're facing right now in our community. Um, so if you can talk a little bit about what's your take on that, and, and I guess get into the concept of racism versus anti-racism, um, that would be great. So um, this is an extraordinary moment. We just need to acknowledge that. And, um, and it's, for me, it's been hugely inspiring and uplifting to see uh, so many people engaged in the streets and, um, uh, it just it feels really righteous and uh, and inspiring. Um, some of the like there's oh, there's there has always been um, solidarity, mutual solidarity between Palestinians and um, and African Americans, uh, certainly among activists at least. Um, we, however. Uh, harbor a lot of anti-black racism in our communities mm -hmm. and some people don't want to confront that some people don't want to face that um, I wrote a couple two a series of uh, two articles um, back to back 
uh, back in 2012 or 2013, uh, addressing <clears throat> anti-Black racism in uh, in Arab uh, in Arab countries and Arab societies in general, and uh, and I got a lot of flack for it. Um, and you know, some similar things popped up this time around uh, with some of the posts. And I do think that you know we just we have to confront it. That said, you know, um, we like I didn't grow up with the same kind of um, racism as it, as it exists here in the United States. So, um, you know, my I started my my life in Kuwait and then in Jerusalem. And we Palestinians were the object of most people's racism. Mm -hmm. So people in Kuwait, the people who had power, um, were a lot darker than us. Uh, my, my grandmother, for example, was a maid for a rich Kuwaiti sheikha um, who, was, uh, who was black herself. So images of power that I, like, that I had growing up, initially at least, were, um, uh, were people who were a lot darker than us. And we were kind of the lower rung. Um, and, you know, racism in the Arab world takes a lot of forms in addition to anti-black racism there's a lot of classism and um, racism along uh, national lines like nationalities um, and so and then you know sort of combining that perspective with the the really um, dichotomous uh, separation here in the US I mean it's very it's a it's black and white there's mm -hmm. there's really no nuance and kind of in the racism that exists here. Um, it's, it's layered and tiered and, and, uh, but it falls along um, clear racial lines, which is not the same in the Arab world. Um, even though in the Arab world, um, so power, at least in my, in my upbringing, power resided with people who were darker than me it was also known to me that standards of beauty were lighter. So we could be, you know, the lower rung of society, but we were also the prettier ones. You know, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you know how, how the Arab world is. So, so yeah, again, like it's, it was really, um, uh, it was, it's, 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 it was complex. One of the, um, so the, the big kind of arguments that happened on Facebook, and even though I, you know, I'm always, I always just hate myself for engaging <laughs> arguments on social media, but I get sucked in, you know, it's black. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the arguments were over the, um, the looting of their so-called, you know, looting of stores. And, um, you know, I don't really, first of all, I objected to, um, to, to them using that term at the same time that that term is not applied to the real looting that happens to all of us all the time. Um, I objected to the focus on that. Um, I objected to the kind of respectability politics, like, okay, you want to, you can protest, but here are the parameters where you're allowed to protest. And I pointed out, you know, this is exactly what Westerners say to us. Oh, great! You know we support you to to protect to to resist nonviolently, but the minute we take up arms or or uh, or or resist this endless terror that's inflicted on Palestinians, when that resistance takes a violent form, suddenly you know we hear these same sounds like, yeah. oh, I can't support that. That's not legitimate. That's bad. That's etc. You know. Um, and it's the same thing. Um, and, but regardless, you know, Palestinians basically are doing the same thing to, to African Americans. I mean, at least I'm just talking about the, these sort of Palestinians that were in disagreement. And it was, and in fairness, it was just a few, it was a handful. It wasn't like mm -hmm. an onslaught or anything. Most Palestinians I know, in fact, are, um, uh, are, you know, have really tight politics and, and they know it's up. But, um, but yeah, so that's where, that's where the, the, uh, communication really broke down was 
was around respectability politics and <clears throat> what is or is not acceptable um you know and and frankly you know for for people who who have literally been terrorized for 400 years i just don't think anybody really has any just gets to say anything i, I really like it's just um uh uh i i frankly think black america has been exceedingly tolerant and patient and um are you still there yes you, you might have to, second, but you're back <laughs> yeah sorry yeah i might have to uh um scooch over to another sofa because my phone's my i just realized the phone battery is uh not working that well um so yeah so that's where the the communication broke down mm -hmm. uh and uh yeah you know a couple of people said oh you know this is this is going to destroy your credibility in our community and and whatnot um but i i do think we need to have have these conversations i mean i feel i feel very strongly um you know uh uh about our role um and and in in, in giving solidarity um unconditional mm -hmm. solidarity and i also want to to point out um something that i think a lot of people don't apparently don't know and it is that most of us are in this country um because of struggles that black people waged mm. you know the we get to come here not because and we get to enjoy a whole lot of rights civil rights that we don't have because white people so generously gave them to us but because mm -hmm. black people fought and struggled and died and sacrificed for them it, i mean so so for, for the palestinians who are who see themselves better as better who are criticizing um the morality of of going into uh capitalist corporations and, and helping oneself um you know just just remember that um the the immigration and naturalization act um that was passed in 1965 uh happened because of a struggle that black people waged we didn't wage it but that act effectively removed um it ended the non the quotas that uh, the U.S. government had on immigration of non-white people into this country. So prior to that, you know, it was mostly only white people were allowed to immigrate here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's good for us to to acknowledge and remember that and really consider um, what it has been like for Black America, what it's like to to exist in this racist country and to see immigrants come and and then look down on them mm -hmm. so um yeah and you know when we like as i think as palestinians i mean this is our community um and you know we take we should take responsibility for that Absolutely. it doesn't mean we're horrible people you know but there's nothing wrong with having these internal discussions and you know i kind of get criticized for you know calling <laughs> calling out and whatnot but it's um you know it's not meant to be that way but we can we can have these these conversations yeah and i think that's exactly the distinction between being a non-racist and an anti-racist it's, it's it is calling out those behaviors and having those you know lucrative discussions where we could as a society and as a culture and as a community move forward um and on this point, you know, I think also something that we've been discussing, I know a lot within PAC, is the, the concept of intersectionality and the, also the concept of solidarity uh, between the Palestinian struggle and the Black Lives Matter struggle. And, um, you know, for one example, Maryam Abu Khalid, who is a Black Palestinian actress, yeah. She's been very outspoken um, and, and very amazing to see the conversations, the conversations and the discussions that she's starting. Yeah. Um, but, you know, how is how how can we take this in? How can we as Palestinians really understand, you know, the points that Mary Mabuchad is trying to say, you know, and how can we tie in the Palestinian struggle to the black struggle in America? 
So first of all, um, Maryam Abu Khalid is brilliant. She's funny. Um, and I, uh, I, 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 I adore her. Um, I think we all do. She's just, she just was this like shooting star that just, you know, popped into our lives and we couldn't get enough of her love affair with the refrigerator at first. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I've watched yeah. those videos so many times. I know. <laughs> um, but I also want to say, um, be careful not to kind of pigeonhole her either. You mm -hmm. know, Maryam, mm -hmm. like she, she's sort of being put into this position where she has, she, she needs to be the person engaging and leading these conversations and explaining and teaching, you know, I, that's a lot to put on one person. Mm -hmm. She happens to be a very talented comedian and a very talented um, actress too. So I think that I would just caution that we not pigeonhole her um, and, uh, you know, and see her in her totality, not just as a black Palestinian woman, you know? Um, so, um, as far as, you know, tying our struggles together, I think they're already, you know, they're, they're already tied together. And, and this kind of predates all of us. Um, this goes back, you know, before I was born, and, you know, with, to, to, um, to the days of the PLO and the Panthers and the ANC and the joint, you know, actual, you know, guerrilla training that they did together, the non-aligned movement, the, um, the political solidarity, um, you know, there was a lot happening in, in that era. And, um, and, you know, it, it, Black America was solidly um, pro-Palestinian. Um, you know, the stances that SNCC took, that Malcolm took, Muhammad Ali, a lot of iconic African-American um, personalities. And the same is true um, uh, in, in reverse. Um, the, uh, um, I actually just uh, a few months ago read um, the newer, the, the updated uh, edition of Huey P. Newton's um, Revolutionary Suicide. Um, and the foreword is, is written by Ahmed Sadat, who's a, a Palestinian political prisoner, a, a well-known known one, um, as you may know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and there, there are countless instances of, um, uh, of these points of solidarity in literature. Um, sorry, look at this guy. He just, he has to be so adorable. He's ridiculous. <laughs> um, and, uh, and academically, and, you know, we saw it in Ferguson. We saw it, um, you know, when, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Palestinian solidarity with uh, the movement to free Mumia Abu-Jamal, uh, Palestinian solidarity when Angela Davis was uh, imprisoned, um, the, the joint um, cooperation and solidarity that's happening now in the streets. You know, I think people understand. I think young people, especially, um, are in a are in a totally different wavelength. And I and and I feel like young people really get it. And um, and I think I think uh, your generation is really going to um, uh, just sort of get rid of a lot of a lot of those. Um, outdated attitudes that I encountered on on Facebook. Yeah, and I think that's that's kind of why I highlighted Maryam Abu Khalid because her refrigerator videos are hilarious and definitely recommend watching. Um, but beyond that, I think she started having those very difficult conversations. Um, it's not on her to do it, but it's, it was amazing to see her pioneering that. Um, yeah. You know, because then you're able to say, look, she's saying it, we can all say it, you know? So it's amazing to see that. And I, I agree with you 100%. I think the, this new generation, the young generation is at the same thing, having those conversations, normalizing these conversations and really calling for long-term action. Um, so to shift gears a little bit, I wanna talk about a very exciting initiative that you co-founded, which is Palestine Rights. Um, and I know that I personally was very bummed when Corona happened because it had to get postponed. Uh, but Palestine Rights is the first Palestinian literature festival in North America. It was supposed to be taking place in NYU. Um, it was three days of readings, talks, and performances in New York City celebrating Palestinian literature. So can you tell us a little bit about your motivation behind that? Um, what started this? 
Yeah. So I'm the co-chair, not co-founder. Um, uh, myself and Professor Bill Mullen are the co-chairs. Um, there's a, we have this uh, wonderful group of activists who are on the board, um, uh, on the steering committee, the organizing committee, we call it. Most of them are members of US HACB, but not all of them. Um, Palestine rights um, is, uh, I mean, it's something I've wanted to see in, in the US for, you know, for like a decade. <laughs> um, but it, and I, I actually, I didn't start it. Um, it was another group in US ACB. Um, they were, you know, kind of wanted to do this as a, as a project of allies. And, um, you know, I kind of, I came on board, I was invited on board and, and I had a completely different vision. Um, and they were kind enough to let me, um, you know, let me put that forward. And, uh, yeah. And, and I think in part, you know, I think being a writer and being sort of immersed in this world of literature, um, I, I really, I feel like literature should be presented as, as a, as an art form in its own right and not as a tool, um, of, not as a tool for politics, not as a tool of resistance. It can be. And I mean, it's all of those things. But our our art, our literature, our society, and our heritage predates Israel by a few thousand years. Mm -hmm. And you know, sort of subordinating everything to to resistance against Israel um, is counterproductive, I think. And so I think it's important for us to celebrate our our this ancient, gorgeous heritage that that we get to inherit. I mean, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to be Palestinian, to come from this fabled place in the world, to, to be so deeply steeped in history and stories um, is, you know, is something I, I'm really proud of and something I cherish. And, and, um, and I celebrate that. And that's, you know, that itself is a political act, but it's, but it doesn't have to be done in order to make a political point is, 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 um, uh, is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. And so we, we decided to bring on um, Palestinian writers uh, who also write in Arabic. Um, that was, you know, something that was important to me to, to try and um, bridge a lot, of, a lot of the things that divide us, right? We're divided by geography. We're divided by language. We're divided by, um, you know, because of these geographic and linguistic divisions, we are uh, divided psychologically in some ways, and, and our society has become, um, you know, tiered and fragmented. And, and so literature is, is a gorgeous way to, to bridge these um, divisions and uh, um, so not just among, not just among uh, uh, writers, but it's important that, that these conversations happen between writers, but also with readers. Like I know there's a lot of writers in this country who write in English who don't know, for example, Hazama Habayeb or Ibrahim Nasrallah or Mahmoud Ashqir, mm. uh, Hanan Sheikh. You know, there's, um, so, I, so, so it was really important to me um, and to our entire organizing committee to, to, bring, uh, to bring people um, uh, who bring Palestinian writers who write primarily in Arabic to be in conversation with, um, with Palestinians who write in English and also with, um, uh, with black, uh, uh, black and brown writers um, and academics as well as indigenous writers and academics and artists. And we had all that planned and it was going to, it was amazing. And it was, we had, um, we were so looking forward and we worked so hard to raise money and, and it was finally coming together. And then of course this happened. Okay. So, um, but we actually, we're, we're in the process of working on something that we will unveil soon. Um, and I might, I'll hit you up to help us publicize it. Inshallah. <laughs> Absolutely. We'd be honored. So what that was going to be my next question. Do you know what the plans are moving forward? Are they going to, 
kind of discuss? I do, I do, but I'm not at liberty to, we haven't publicized it yet and, and things aren't final yet, but things, you know, I can say that things are happening um, and they will be made public soon. So we didn't just, we didn't just go to sleep. So yeah. that's exciting. We'll be very much looking forward to that. And I'll make sure to post it on all of our pack pages because absolutely this is, this really is an initiative that, and as I say, like, you know, it really does make you proud. Um, and I know a lot of our community members are very excited and ready to come uh, out for the event. So we're very excited to see what comes out. Um, so I'm receiving, so if anyone has any questions, we're gonna now open this up to the audience questions. Um, I received the first question uh, from one of our community members, Lamia Askar. Um, she's asking about your, the initiative, um, the Playgrounds for Palestine, um, which was an initiative that you started, um, you know, inspired by your daughter, seeing that, you know, she loved playgrounds and wanting to do the same for Palestinians. Um, she's, can you talk a little bit more about that initiative and how many playgrounds were built and how many are you working on building moving forward? Um, so thank you, Lamia. Um, so Lamia's sister, I know Lamia, her sister, Hanan Yurek, is, um, is, is basically uh, my co-pilot or I'm her co-pilot with Playgrounds for Palestine. And um, we, uh, we, have, we have a wonderful board of um, Palestinian women and non-Palestinian women. We've been together, most, most of us, for uh, like 20, 20 years since we started it. Um, we, it's still an all-volunteer group. None of us gets paid. Um, we raise money annually by um, holding a benefit dinner, and we also, throughout the year, sell Palestinian olive oil. So if you have um, if you if you need some Palestinian olive oil, want some fair trade, organic, really good stuff, go to playgroundsforpalestine.org um, and uh, go in the shop button. You'll see some of our olive oil. We have our uh, we got our own private label. It's called Ida, um, and the oil is all from Palestine. It's all fair trade, organic, extra virgin, um, all that. It's delicious. Um, so we have. I've lost count, honestly, of how many playgrounds. I, I should have looked that up before. But we, we're actually just, we're building a new, it's in the 40s, 40-some. Um, 40 That's not including the programs that we have launched, children's programs. So, for example, um, we're building a playground uh, in Ishruq, um, which is a, in a school for, for, for the blind. Um, so it's a very tactile um, and auditory a very sensory playground um, for kids at that school. We also um, are currently about to fund a an initiative that um, is run by the Palestine Animal League mm -hmm. that um, uh, uh, in, that sort of holds a lot of programs for children to really help bring them back to our roots and our the way that we um, traditionally treated animals um, and, and to try and dispel the, some of the fear that exists um, toward cats and dogs in the street um, and to really try and foster relationships with, um, with animals that are based on empathy and kindness and, um, uh, and tenderness. So, you know, it's it's a it's a fun thing for children to do to play to uh, to get to know dogs. Those are my dogs. I don't know what they're doing right now. Um, and so we're funding that. We also um, uh, diverted some of our funds this year because we couldn't build playgrounds because of COVID to emergency relief for um, for uh, people who were struggling because of um, because of the pandemic. And we, we put our resources um, all in one village. Um, uh, and yeah, and we, basically, we just distributed um, direct aid through the, through the local municipality um, to families that lost their, who, can't, who couldn't go to work in Israel. I mean, it, you know, it was a traditionally agricultural village that lost their lands because Israel stole it and then um, 
you know, breadwinners had to go and work in Israel. I mean, you know the story. And then with the pandemic, they suddenly had no income. So there were a lot of there are a lot of families in that situation that situation around Ramadan and you know, with the Eid coming up, with the Eid uh, approaching at the time, they, uh, you know, it was just, it was, a, it was just much needed aid. So that's where most of the funding has gone this year was, was for emergency relief. And uh, yeah. That's amazing. Um, so Farah Khadr is asking, Suzanne, are there any voices or perspectives that you feel are missing from Palestinian or Palestinian American fiction? Or are there any aspects of Palestinian history or culture that you wish were highlighted in more novels? Um, gosh, yeah, you know, sort of this, um, um, the, the literary terrain in this country has only recently opened up to us, um, to Palestinians. And, um, and, you know, there's, Palestine doesn't just have one story, you know, it's, it has thousands of stories. So I do see, I mean, we're missing, you know, thousands of, of those stories. Um, you know, I, I also, I think even in Arabic, not just in English, mm -hmm. there, there, we're lacking um, stories that take place um, long before Israel came you know, came to town. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I'm guilty of this too, because we, you know, as writers, as artists, we, we often write from places that are painful. And our greatest wound, our greatest collective wound is this Nakba and, and the Naksa and this, and this ongoing horrors. And so we tend to write from that wound and, um, and not go too far back into history. But I think that, um, I mean, I personally would love to read more, um, you know, more novels that take place um, in, in, you know, centuries gone. For, there, there's, um, I did, uh, the last one I read that um, sort of takes place in an era long before Israel, was Qanadil Malik al Jalil um, by Ibrahim Nasrallah. I don't, I don't, I don't know if it's translated. I think it is translated in English now. Um, I read it years ago in Arabic, and um, I think it's in the 16th century. Takes place. In, um, anyway, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I love historic fiction in general. That's my genre. That's what I'm attracted to as a reader. Um, and I would, you know, I'd like to see um, more literature from, from you know, uh, previous times. But also, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I, I'm, I appreciate characters and lives of people who, um, who again, don't kind of conform to this idea of, of who we think Palestinians are. Um, so yeah, like, I'd like to, I, I want to read more, um, Palestinian literature from gay authors, from LGBTQ Palestinians, um, from, uh, yeah, just, I mean, there's so many, there's so many, um, things that are still taboo for us to talk about. Um, but, you know, so we have, I mean, the good thing is that we have a, you know, the terrain is wide open for, for writers and artists to jump into, um, and, and start these conversations and, and give these stories. Um, so yeah, there's, it's, it's kind of literature is a, is a vast terrain anyway, and it's limitless, but I think especially for us in Anglophile literature and English, um, uh, you know, there's the opportunities are, are huge. Yeah, absolutely. I think with literature, it's, there's always something left to be untapped. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Zahwa Ahmed asks, she says, I'm, I'm also Palestinian born in, um, uh, Palestinian American born in Kuwait. We were kicked out, as you mentioned. However, the Kuwaiti stance among the Gulf states now is actually quite honorable. Perhaps you can comment on the Gulf country's current stand on Palestine, Israeli issue, and Kuwait stance. 
Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So an interesting thing happened in Kuwait. Um, you know, for for a while after the um the first Gulf War, they, you know, there was they hated us and um you know, I mean, uh, I'm not going to comment on whether that was deserved or not. That's not the point. Um, and it was complicated. It was a complicated situation. Um, but I think in time, after Kuwait, you know, after after time passed and they experienced life without Palestinians there, um, I think they they came to understand how important our presence had been in Kuwait, what we had actually contributed to that country that they have not really been able to recover since. Um, Palestinians who live there uh, made Kuwait their home. So, so we were invested in the country. We were invested in, in its success. Um, most of the teachers in the public schools were Palestinian. And they taught, they taught with, uh, they taught their students, not because those were jobs that they just wanted to collect a paycheck and then send it back home to Egypt or whatever, right? They, they, they did their jobs because it was their home, because they were invested in the students and in the success and in the development of the country. Um, so that's just, uh, you know, the education sector is just an, an example. But that same principle applies in nearly every sector of Kuwaiti um, life, including um, uh, health care and um, uh, it's hospitality, everything. So, um, you know, I, you know, you can, it's, it, it was a, dis, you know, it was, it was a fight among brothers and sisters is what, you know, it ultimately was. And um, I've been really proud of Kuwait um, and the stands that they have taken, despite the extraordinary pressure that has been placed on them by neighboring countries like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, um, who, who are quite keen on normalizing relationships with Israel. Um, so um, it's, it's actually, you know, how do I feel about, about that? Um, it's depressing. It really is depressing. But it's also not surprising. I think we make the mistake of assuming that just because people, just because people are called Arab and just because they speak Arabic doesn't mean that those are our people. Um, and this is actually, you know, going back to the, the articles I mentioned about anti-Black racism, those two that were published. The original, the, the, the original one that I wrote was making exactly this point that, you know, we always try and talk to the West and then we always assume that Arabs are on our side. But we never look to, like our conversation has historically been very, Eurocentric and and Anglocentric, and it has um, it, it it has taken for granted that just because you know that all the Arabs sort of understand the situation as we do, um, but in reality we have had lifelong friends in um, in in most African countries who have stood by us um, in a lot of. South American countries who have always stood by us. Um, and, and here, you know, power is attracted to power. Gulf states are powerful and they're attracted to Israel. And that and this isn't something new. This has been going on for decades, but it's just, it's just, they're just able to bring it to the surface now. Yeah, and that, that makes sense. Um, I definitely can see a lot of great points there, especially the Gulf countries and their stance on Palestine. Um, so so uh, Yara asks uh, a question. She first thanks you for speaking on solidarity and for your role in using Palestinian culture as a medium for not only activism, but healing. Uh, her question is, what have you found to be the most effective method of bringing non-Arabs into the conversation, but without exhausting them emotionally as many Palestinians suffer from burnout? 
Um, bringing, you're saying bringing non-Palestinians into the conversation about Palestine, is that? So bringing non-Arabs into the conversation, yes. By, okay. Yes. So I have to say that I, um, I don't really try to do that. Um, I, in part, I feel like people can read my books if they want. Um, I kind of resent uh, when people, when non, um, non-Arabs or non-Palestinians expect uh, Palestinians to show them the way, to teach them, to, to prove our humanity, to explain things to them. That's not my job. Um, and, you know, every, it's, it's every individual's own job, every community's own job to educate themselves. And just like, you know, it's our job to educate ourselves about anti-Black racism. I wouldn't ask a Black person to, you know, to come, like, explain this to me and, and, and make me a better person. You know, the labor should not be shifted to, uh, onto the victims to explain their humanity. Um, it's, it's the emotional labor of engaging in those things um, those conversations is, is huge. And frankly, you know, and I used to do it and to some extent, you know, I, I stumble into it every once in a while, but it's exhausting and I don't want to do it. Um, our, you know, our own community needs my energy, um, more than people outside of it who, who just kind of want to come in and just be voyeurs. And there's plenty of books they people can read. If somebody's asking me, I'll, you know, I'll recommend a book, like go do the labor yourself, put in the time to make yourself a better person. It is not my job. It is not our job. That's how I feel about it. And I think that sentiment makes a lot of sense. Um, we're going to take this last question from Michael, uh, where he asked, do you feel that all the Palestinian, uh, Palestinian solidarity groups operating in the U.S. are working in sync with each other, or can they be consolidated to utilize resources more effectively to achieve clear objectives and goals? If so, how? So I think, you know, these sort of questions have been posed in nearly every struggle that has ever existed everywhere, anywhere. Um, and yes, one could always make the argument that, you know, we, we're, we're, we're better pooling our resources and, 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 uh, uh, and occasionally the coalitions are successful. Um, but not all, not all groups are, are politically aligned, um, to the point that they can be fully integrated with each other. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm a member of a, of a lot of Palestinian organizations. Uh, the group I, I work mostly with are, um, uh, you know, besides like Palestine Rights and Playgrounds for Palestine, the, you know, the, those kinds of project-driven um, groups are, but, you know, the, the political organizations that I work mostly with are U.S. ACPI and Workers World Party, um, of which I'm a member. Um, you know, I... I uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I love working with my communist comrades and, and I don't always feel aligned with a lot of other groups necessarily. Um, it doesn't mean that I, you know, I'm not, it's not a crit criticism of them and it doesn't delegitimize them, but we don't, I don't think we have to all coordinate and, and we, we end up putting a lot of effort into trying to, to coalesce um, that we, that we, you know, we just kind of, we lose a lot of momentum trying to constantly make that happen. Whereas I think there are moments when we, or we can organically, we just have to count on moments when we all will, will organically come together because, because the very, the foundation, even if we differ politically on, on, this or that, at the very heart of it is a liberation struggle. At the very heart of it is a desire for Palestinian liberation and a work and a commitment towards Palestinian liberation. Um, so, you know, in moments like this, in, in revolutionary moments like um, the, the, the rebellion that's happening in the United States, I mean, there's or, a lot of organic coalescing of like-minded organizations. 
you know, there are a lot of socialist and communist groups in Philadelphia that um, are, are, you know, joining hands with Workers World Party and, and we do a lot of things together and it happens organically. Um, but I think it's fine. It's fine for, for groups to, to do their own thing. And then, you know, when, um, when there's an opportunity, when there's a need, we can, you know, we can come together. Yeah, I think that definitely speaks volumes. We, we need to kind of figure out ways to work together, but at the same time, everyone doing what they can is, ends up getting us a little closer to liberation. Um, we have a final request from Hamda asking if you could um, repeat the book's name, the one that you mentioned by Ibrahim Nasrallah, and if you have a link or a way that someone could purchase it um, or get it. Um, it's called Qanadir uh, Malik Al Jalil. Hello? Yes, you're back. Yeah, sorry. It's called Qanadir um, Malik Al Jalil. Um, let me see if I have it on my bookshelf. I'm just going to walk over here. Um, I might have lent it out to somebody. I'm tired of lending my books out to people. Don't bring them back. It's like the worst. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't see it. It's a it's a pretty thick book, but it's really good. Um, yeah, I don't see it. Shoot. Okay, so Qanadil Malik Al Jalil. It may be. Um, it may well be translated into English, and if it is, I'm guessing it's like the lanterns of the King of Galilee or something. The King of Galilee's lanterns. So, yeah. Nope, I don't see it. Well, I hope you find it. <laughs> yeah, it's my, my bookshelf is a mess. So there's the other one. Anyway, yeah, that's how you know your bookshelf's put to good use. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so very much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, learning more about the work you do, and it's truly an inspiration. I want to thank you very much for your time. Um, and for all of your efforts. And I think I echo the sentiment from everybody where we thank you for all of your work. Thank you, Danya. I appreciate this. Thanks for everything you do at PAC and everything that PAC does. Absolutely. And I hope we're, you know, together we're going to be able to continue and slowly get one step closer to Palestinian liberation. Um, so for everybody who's tuning in, please make sure to take the census at your earliest convenience and we challenge you to not only take it, but get five other people to do it as well. Um, these webinars are brought to you by PAC. Don't forget to see a full list of our upcoming events and to donate to keep these programs going by visiting www.paccusa.org. We hope to see you in our future webinars. If you liked anything you saw, please make sure to support and donate what you can at www.pacusa.org slash donate dash now. And I want to remind you that next week we have Hussam Zumla joining us. Um, and the week after that we have Anurwa, or we're going to have the executive director of Anurwa joining us as well. Um, I see Farah put in the link to the book that was on request. And yes, Lanterns King Galilee, very close translation. <laughs> So with that, I thank you all for attending. Thank you again, Suzanne, so much for your time. I hope everyone has Thanks. a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.